What's up, Go Enthusiasts? Welcome back to the Games of Blood and Tears with the sixth game. Hong Long is on a winning streak. He's regained from the first three losses. He's taken the series to two to three, and in doing so, we've seen his brilliance. We've seen him learn in the series, mid-series, how he wants to keep the pressure on Jujing. He's decided he's going to be making a lot of weak groups, and he saves them really, really boldly in ways that Jujing Yu simply can't hope to match. He's going to try the same strategy this game, but, but, Zhu Jingyu shows that he can improve too. We're going to see Zhu Jingyu put up a better performance, and maybe, just maybe, it'll be enough to stop the Huang Longsha winning streak. Huang Longsha starts with a 3-4, and then he goes with an approach. You can see already he's jumping into the black inside of their, maybe, Moyo, with the three stones forming a huge formation in the bottom right. And he plays a 3-space, which, of course, as a player who wants to defend later in the game, you're going to be uh, interested in. Many players don't like playing the 3-space. They'd rather play the 2-space and feel more solid this way. Because when you play the 3-space, later on you can get invaded, and then you have to take care of your weak stones. It can be pretty difficult to do. Huang Longsha wants to take care of his weak stones in a way which is pretty difficult. That's how he's been beating Zhu Jingyu. And so 3-space perfectly suits his style and even suits the overall board as well, making sure that this whole black influence on the bottom right half of the board will not turn out to be a big territory naturally. Well, Zhu Jingyu says, well, the bottom side won't, but what about the right side? Let me just go and play on the right side, and Huang Longshi approaches, this time from the outside. If you approach from the inside with this stone already here, you could get in some trouble. So approaching from the outside is natural. Of course, Zhu Jingyu chooses to kick and pincer. Say, of course, but nowadays we only see this in Q games. Don players have it uh, taught, it's instilled within them that this is not good to do. Uh, however, Huang Xiu won't actually punish it effectively in this game. <laughs> so, shooting you, he gets away with it. Uh, the common way that we should handle this if you are worried about getting kicked and pincered in your own games, I recommend not to play Huang Xiu's method of just another random invasion but to play the attach and the extend like this. If your opponent continues to extend underneath, as they usually do, they like to try to get as much corner territory as possible, then you can play this cut. Uh, the importance of playing this cut first, well, it puts a sort of a landmine inside of Black's territory. Black should really try to capture that as cleanly as possible, lest they get attacked on one side or the other, but when they do, it gives you this Atari first, and then this Hane as well. Then you can see all of these moves come in Sente, and at the end, the black corner territory, before they kick and pincer, they wanted that to be big, it really is not that impressive. So white can continue to just spend an extra move on defense outside, and really this white has become a very impressive influence for the outside. It's worth more uh, per stone than, than it really ought to be. So this would be a variation where white gains and uh, has a slightly better result in the corner. I think both players probably knew that this could happen, and Zhu Jingyu liked it for Black, and Huang Lu should probably agree, because this is the handicap game, and Black has a super strong position, and White has a relatively strong position, and this Blackstone wouldn't get attacked that hard, so not that much stuff can happen. There's not that easy uh, fighting feel of the continuations in the upper right corner. So Huang Longsha played instead the invasion to the right side immediately. Uh, objectively, this is just, just bad because when Zhu Jingyu defends in the corner like this, it's like the kick and pincer was in a reasonable position. If you can get the defense to the corner and the pincer stone, then these two stones should naturally feel lost. And even this one stone, it's, as well, it's been pincered on both sides. It doesn't have an easy base to get. Huang Longsha can only jump out. And uh, the, the fair evaluation of this position is, is simple. It's Black has managed to start taking territory with all of his stones, and he's attacking, and White has managed to do neither. <laughs> he's defending, and he's not getting territory. It's not a very good, efficient shape for White. And Black continues by attacking directly. He just plays a diagonal out into the center. This is a reasonable move in this case, because if you would ignore the center area, then this whole Black group may end up surrounded and having to Oh, some embarrassing moves inside in the future. So very reasonable start from Zhu Jingyu. And Huang Longsha plays this attach on the top side. So here he comes. Huang Longsha has gotten his position with the weak stones. He did it in a 
pretty awkward and <laughs> inefficient way. But from here, this is where Huang Yusha has gained in all the previous games. This is where Huang Yusha has showed his strength and how he's just a better player than Zhu Jingyu. Attach, it starts a fight. Let's see if Huang Yusha can really follow through. Zhu Jingyu's Hane to the outside is very reasonable in this circumstance. Wait is supposed to Hane inside. This was the plan when you attach, you Hane inside, and then you get this shape when you're supposed to be satisfied as white. Well, at least my shape is very solid, black as a cutting point, and, and I can run out. But somehow I don't feel very satisfied for white, right? <laughs> like, even though this is Huangxia's plan, and this shape that he chose, the jump, is very nice. It means if black tries to push and cut, there's going to be a double Atari. And it's a very simple variation, black. Pushes once, and White shows with this, then he's going to be fine, and Black takes a base. Uh, White could have also chosen to connect like this instead, and pushes through, you can uh, Tiger's Mouth. But Huang Xie didn't want to do this, because it's a little looser towards these two stones, which are the actual weak group in, in his position. So instead, by playing here, he still continues to have this double Atari. Um, Black can cut, but it's going to sacrifice a stone on the top side that's pretty painful for black. So he just starts by taking a base normally, like a, a normal person. And still this result, although this pushing exchange was definitely bad for black to play right away, it's a good result for uh, black regardless, considering handicap game and, and all that. Maybe objectively the result is fine for white. I mean, he's managed to save his groups and even link them together. That's, that's not that bad. But he doesn't have the weak groups anymore. So I think that uh, Zhu Jingyu's method of handling Huang Xie's defense by just saying, hey, you could go ahead and take that area, which is relatively small on a simple base, it was effective. Zhu Jingyu has so far been been uh, doing better against the Huang Xie crazy defense strategy. So Huang Xie makes another weak group. <laughs> of course, what else can you do when your weak groups become strong and your plan is to defend your weak groups, but make a new one, right? I mean, uh, we're not just going to treat this existing weakness on the top side as influence and try to attack this, this uh, original Blackstone and basically break the territory tactic Blackstone in the corner as well. Make a big, big fuss over the right side. It's a good strategy to try to start something. And Zhu Jingyu plays the diagonal move out. He doesn't want to wait to connect underneath. And he's taking a very firm stance here. He's saying, I'm going to run that stone out, I'm going to disconnect your two groups, and I'm going to have some pressure on, on both sides as a result. White says, I dare you. <laughs> Black's like, I will really dare. I really do it. And he went through and pushed and gave up the double Atari. This is crazy from Black. I mean, honestly, a pretty insane insane uh, decision to, to, to push through and fully sacrifice a stone to cut these four stones right away. But it kind of works. I mean, the computer's not a fan. I'm not really a fan until I thought about it more. And I'm thinking here, I'm thinking like, well, as white, what, are, what would I do? It's tough, actually, because black is keeping a lot of pressure on three groups right now. The, the white stones on the top side are not fully settled. If black can surround them, they'd be dead. So that's something to watch out for. But the white groups on the right side, I mean, these four stones and these two stones, both of them, let alone fully settled, they aren't settled at all, and they don't even have that easy of a job running out, especially these four stones. Your intuition uh, would lead you to believe, well, if these four stones just die, <laughs> that's, that looks like a lot of area for Black, right? I mean, just imagine, whoop, <laughs> that's a, a lot of Black intersections that they have twirling around there. It doesn't look so fun, you know, and, and Black doesn't seem to have invested enough to really deserve that. But if you run out of those four stones, then the two other groups that you haven't really saved yet, they become problems of their own as well. So in the game, Huang Xie approaches this with a, a very soft attitude. He plays the peep here, and of course Black can just answer, and then he jumps from his three stones. So what he's done is he's he's basically saying, go ahead and capture those four stones if you want. I'm going to let you have that territory. That big box of black swirling icons is just going to be Zhu Jingyu's. And uh, the reason why that, that, that has happened is that Zhu Jingyu set up a position where it was just, I mean, objectively, it may have been possible here to try to run out with some crazy moves and some counterattacks, but 
it was just so difficult to actually uh, pull it off for Huang Lingxue. Huang Lingxue left himself in a position with so much pressure that he couldn't help but buckle under it. And, and eventually, he didn't choose to play that kind of crazy move, which, uh, you know, if you play here, white can, or black can, can chase after your two stones and then chase after your, your two groups, and you kind of have to justify that you had a stone there. And then if you do that in some awkward way, black can easily punish your other stones. So um, very understandable that Huang should dodged, <laughs> did, did not want to, to fully like smack his face into that fight. And yet this position where Huang should felt forced to run with these three stones, I mean, capping looked good until you see this move, I guess, where black takes the corner in this, in this very pleasant way. When, Wade continues with this kick, which, by the way, is a really interesting move. I, I quite appreciate this kick rather than an attach to the bottom side. That's sort of my my natural instinct. But kicking first asks Black what kind of, of um, shape that they want to make on the bottom side here. Black chooses to back off, which uh, it, it was very surprising to me that this is correct. Uh, if Black will just block like this, uh, this is very normal and natural, and yet it's slightly less efficient for black than the game. Um, in this way, what Wei has gained by making that kicking exchange is just the fact that the attach forces black to completely answer to the side with the, the hane, uh, or sorry, with the descend. In the game, when he uh, plays like this, black and hane. Black can play that more aggressive move, looking to reach into the bottom side, and uh, he isn't really caring about his cutting points in the corner. Huang Xu says, hey, you don't you have to care about them? That means I can double Hane. Because when Black Hataris and captures, then Wade can capture some stones in the corner. Wade, Wade does that. And yet this result was actually good for Black, not good for White. It looks like it should be pretty nice for White. I mean, White managed to take this much territory. And at the same time, that Black area... I mean, <laughs> it's embarrassing to even put the swirling icons there for only three points. <laughs> However, in terms of efficiency per stone, black is like fully alive, 100% fully alive and even strong with not that many stones at all. Meanwhile, Wei has locally invested more stones, actually, especially considering the stones which, which black captured underneath his formation and doesn't have that much of a advantage in territory to show for it. You could argue that these three stones are too close to this white living shape. Uh, and you can also argue that white lost Sente. The fact that white is the one who has to end capturing this one stone, making sure black can't switch the corner back from white to black, it means that black can play the final move in the center, killing off these four stones for good. Even though they could have run uh, earlier, this variation which black chose got him Sente as opposed to those other variations, or is defending the corner in, in Gote, that means that he could start and finish the fight on the right side himself. And actually, this opening has worked out really well for Zhu Jingyu. He's managed to parry these very aggressive and, and fast movements by Huang Lingxue by choosing his own aggressive and fast plays in the bottom right corner, and especially this cut, it was actually quite an impressive adjustment by Zhu Jingyu, quite impressive demonstration of how he's been learning from the previous five games in the series. Huang Xie continues making another regroup, of course. <laughs> so what if the opening didn't work out so well for Huang Lingxie? He still has another 200 moves to go in this game to break the back. And he'll actually accomplish uh, <laughs> quite a lot in short order. However, for now, the game is still about these four stones, and Huang Xie just can't quite get his finger on how to treat them correctly. Black plays this diagonal move. To be honest, it's a uh, pretty good move here, this, this diagonal. It uh, is not only making sure that Wei can't sacrifice these stones in what would effectively be Sente if Wei had played here. Uh, Black is going to have a hard time daring to do this for several reasons Wei can try to trade back, and even if this happens, um, it's going to be difficult for Black to always be sure that he can keep these white stones from running out and establishing some kind of strong counterattack. So by denying all of the Aji that Wei has there, 
uh, Black has even expanded his territory and given himself a route into the white area here. And it's possible that later on, Black can think about Atariing and saving this one stone and even attacking this whole white group in the bottom right corner. Well, white, as you saw, he started with his attachment. This is Huang Yingxia showing his skill for handling weak groups. Huang Yingxia is saying, hey, if you try to kill these four stones too hard, maybe I'll be able to get something in the corner. And black blocks the corner correctly. If it, instead it had been like this, even a direct through three invasion is extremely difficult to answer. So Zhu Jingyu uh, shuts it down correctly by playing this block and saying, hey, you're allowed to do stuff on the side where I've prepared. I'm ready to try to attack that. You're not allowed to do stuff in the corner where my shape is a bit weaker. And so Huang Hongxia descends one time. He says, hey, I'm threatening to do something on the side now, which I would really be ready to strike. So black stops that. Make sure to block and play the most uh, tight move, meaning the move which has the most direct effects, effects on liberties and life and death for the, the white uh, group here. There's no way Huang Hongxia could continue to fight with that one. That's why he just plays the Hane. And black answers. And Huang Yingxia shows how <laughs> really fantastic he was at handling weak groups. I mean, it, to me, it's it's pretty difficult to think of how to continue playing here in a way that poses serious problems to Black. I mean, White is obviously just dead everywhere. But Huang Yingxia plays this move, and it was really good. <laughs> it was a, a very uh, brilliant move of, of his own by, by Huang Yingxia. Black chooses to back off completely like this. And what's more is that it was correct. I think Zhu Jingyu is, is just as impressive as Huang Yingxia here to show that he's, he's been learning from <laughs> how to handle this kind of thing in the previous games. Um, that move is correct? It's crazy, right? Well, black can't do just eating this one stone. White could play this Atari and this cut. And you can see if these three stones die for black, that's gonna be a disaster. So black should save them. And yet, saving them is not that easy. Ultimately, even if uh, Black can capture these two stones, weight coming back over here is, is obviously easily alive, and this would be a disaster for Black. So the same kind of thing happens if Black tries any splitting move here. You may wonder then why Black didn't try to play a connecting move. What this move seems to gain is that when White plays the connection underneath, it isn't an Atari anymore. So it seems like this prevents that kind of endgame in Sente and potential extra eye space in Sente for the white group on the top side. However, in fact, the move that Zhu Jingyu played in the game had a greater effect. And the reason why is, is that if black starts with this connection, white can start where black played like this. And this is an extremely aggressive option for white to try to either save in the corner save through. If black plays here, white is planning to cut directly. What this does is it creates a liberty shortage for black in the corner due to black's connection. Even though black can eat these two stones in what seems to be a fantastic shape, when white plays here, it's threatening to Atari and capture the three stones in the center. Black can switch the sequence a bit, so in this time, <laughs> black can play the connect here, but still when white pushes through like this, it's going to be almost impossible to stop this weight on the side from making a living shape. So the invasion could be a success. So in fact, when Huang Yingxia played this attach, he was already prepared to try to save this inside in these fantastic ways, and Zhu Jingyu, recognizing the power that Huang Yingxia really had to save those weak stones, falls back to defend them. Really powerful sequence by both players here to play Hane, an attach in the corner, followed by a complete retreat, and yet it was due to Black's weaknesses that this was necessary. White switches now. So rather than con trying to continue in the upper right corner, playing an additional Atari, which could easily lose to a loss of Sente, White plays the jump in the center. And this is really difficult for Black to try to push through and cut. He has a lot of weaknesses in the center. So he simply tries to fall back and maintain connection to his, his one stone at Tengen. That allows White to play a couple extra forcing moves, fixing his cut and threatening to play a Hane, breaking through the center. Wait, is not going to get allowed to do that. And so ultimately here, you can see through Huang Yingxia's sacrificial play after Black played this move on the uh, right side, 
He's managed to gain something in the corner and then gain some strength on the top side as well. It was very, very nicely done, but it's not like Zhu Jingyu made any mistakes during these sequences either. Huang She must continue to make weak groups, must continue to make interesting situations, and he plays this invasion to the top side. I think this is a really enterprising and good uh, try from Huang She. Black plays the attach and cut. Now, if Huang She had done this earlier, before getting these extra exchanges in the center, then Black would have chosen to play the tiger's mouth, and White could make a spit shape like this, but Black's ability to uh, run out here would be keeping a lot of pressure on this top white group at the same time as black gains a lot of directions to run It would be very dangerous except for the fact that way has all these extra forcing moves all this additional strength In the corner and in the center is going to allow white to make this fight quite easy. In fact That's why this white invasion was well timed It is benefiting from the strength that white gained while sacrificing the right side Black is forced instead to play this cut. And what this cut means is when white Atari is here, black plans to sacrifice that one stone. He plays the Atari and the Atari under. If instead black had tried to save that one stone, when white connects here, those three stones of black on the top side are already dead, which means that this whole white is very strong and even the black group on the upper left now is in some residual danger. So instead, I think it was a reasonable decision by Zhu Jingyu to play the cut. And white presses, trying to prevent black from playing the turn and making this co something where black is likely to capture stone. Black plays this Atari, capturing the co anyway, and white plays a co threat. This was frankly shocking to me when I <laughs> was watching the game for the first time. I had no idea that it could even be possible for White to try to fight a Ko like this. White is really fighting this Ko. He, he means it. He's actually going to try to say, I have enough Ko threats to win this Ko enough times that I can keep serious pressure on your top side group. Why? Because he is a dead group. The dead group inside, it was useful in the corner, it was useful in the center, and now one more time he's using it for Ko threats to play this unprecedented variation on the top side. And, and Black can't really believe it either. I think he, he plays this Hane. He's like, come on, man. You, you can't actually keep this Ko going while you attack me the entire time. That's, that's ridiculous. That's a, like an entire local fight worth of Ko threats that you need to keep this up. And Huang Longsha says, well, why can't I? Because <laughs> he does have quite a few Ko threats in the upper right corner. He, could, he just cuts. He says, what are you going to do about it, man? Black's like, well, I'm going to win the co, obviously. And White's like, not if I have some co-threats. Uh, Black answers. And Black's like, I have a co-threat too. Look, Atari. Comes back and White's like, well, I have co-threats. <laughs> yeah, this attach is a little bit of a losing co-threat. I think it would have been better to choose some of his co-threats in the upper right corner that lost a bit less than this first. As you can see, when Black pushes through here, it makes it so that if Black would win the co, this white group is getting in significantly more trouble after exchanging that uh, that <laughs> attach and uh, and black pushing through. But White isn't really concerned about that, because he thinks he's going to win the co. What does winning the co even look like? I mean, it's hard to imagine when when White wins the co, he's going to be just be playing some other local move and then fighting the co again. That's why it's so difficult to imagine playing this kind of co. But actually, Zhu Yu, he makes a mistake. He plays this Atari. And what this is looking to do is make a very natural split shape in the upper left corner, but what it actually does is it makes the ko more important for white. Zhu Jingyu uh, would have been better served locally by playing this Atari as his ko threat, and then coming back to try to win the ko. Still, the ko is big enough for black to win, but if he plays it this way, white has no way to win this ko in any glorious and, and shocking fashion. He can only except that he got an Atari from, from Black on the side and, and try to move on. In this sequence, White is going to go for more. He's going to keep trying to win this coat. So he, he invests all the way into making this big coat threat inside. Of course, capturing those five stones is always bigger than capturing the one stone on the top side there. It would break so much territory and allow even all the Blacks to start getting counterattacked. And 
black simply connects. So this is not unreasonable because black doesn't have any serious co-threats from now. So he's just playing big moves and he's waiting for white to make the co bigger and he's hoping that he'll have a big enough co-threat at the end to make this all worth it. And white does that. White invests. So making this co really, really, really big right now. If white can win, then he'll capture those two stones and even the whole topside group as a result. And he'll be so strong that he can attack the black in the upper left as well. He plays a massive co-threat, running out these four stones threatens to eat these now six stones. That's definitely worth it. Black answers. And now it's Black's turn to find a threat. Feel free to pause the video and, and see if you can figure out what, what threat would you play if you were Black here? Because you don't have anything. There's no local co-threats of note from here. You have to find the biggest move on the rest of the board where you can win the biggest two moves in a row. Black chooses to play this attachment. Attach in the bottom left corner of the board. White, of course, answers, eats the upper left, and Black just plays a Hane. And what Black has done is he's made it so that these two white stones on the bottom side are, are now quite weak, and this kind of attack would never be tolerated under normal circumstances not to do with a co. But it wasn't the biggest. This actually allows White to claw his way back into the game. That co that he's played for so long, he lost so much by playing all these co threats. It earned all the way back. I mean, Wei has won the entire top side, and even from here, he plays this move. Um, <laughs> he's so satisfied with the fact that basically the entire upper left corner is now his. He plays a sort of calm attacking move. To be honest, it probably would be better to play a wider attacking move like this, wider and wilder, where... Uh, the black turning in the corner doesn't really allow black to make in two eyes or, or save itself. This is going to be really dangerous if black wants to try to run, since white is so amazingly strong on the top side. So I prefer attacking like that rather than this kind of more passive attack, making sure to solidify the corner and letting black play on the side as he wants. However, you can't deny that white is, is definitely gaining in this sequence. So I, I get a sense of satisfaction from Huang Xie when he plays here. I get a sense that he must have been quite pleased with his <laughs> with his result and his fight on the top side, which is really quite uh, quite brilliant. From here, yeah, Black is going to continue to attack the group in the bottom right and attack the group on the bottom. And here you can see actually why Black's co-threats were not the biggest. Instead of playing those co-threats, it would have been better for Black to play this co-threat. This co-threat, although it doesn't seem to attack in the same way, it actually denies weight pretty effectively from any reasonable method of capturing these stones when you play like this. Because if weight, let's say, plays peep and tries to block over here, Black always has the option to try to link uh, underneath. And by using that option, he also has some serious Aji in the center. So in a variation like this, you can see White is actually going to have to directly capture these black stones inside. It's something of a squeeze for black. If he had played it as a co-threat, it could be even more than a squeeze. So here, when White answers, if black gives himself just a little bit of assistance outside, Rather than a squeeze that Black has here, he has a serious attack going on this bottom right white group. White has a tough time now capturing these two stones, and if he has to not capture these two stones, he doesn't have two eye. When Black plays here, Huang Lingxue recognizes his problem. And he doesn't do anything about it. And he allows Black to spend even another move. Why? Because Huang Lingxue has been winning all of his games by defending his group. So he says, I dare you to find the good way to attack me there. I'm going to go make another weak group, save another weak group in the corner, and catch up by being just so fast. And I think it's a nice method by Huang Lingxue here. Although Black connects here, and, uh, you know, locally, this sequence doesn't really inspire anything amazing for white. In fact, white got Hane to the head of three stones two times and had to just sort of save meekly at the end. Uh, globally, this black influence has a difficult time being effective. And the black influence to the bottom side, while maybe if black spends another move, it can capture this one stone that wouldn't end up being a very impressive amount of territory per stone. 
so Black tries to continue attacking. However, his method of attacking it wasn't directly saving that one stone. <laughs> Probably he thought that that would be too aggressive to try to save that stone, to try to really fight with it. As we saw, it wasn't really too aggressive because the fact that it made that eye false for white and the fact that white you know, hasn't really gotten any strength in the center to be able to save that, um, <laughs> like, to be able to keep the attack on to capture them, it would have been much more aggressive and good for black to play like this. And you can be assured if it's Huang Longshe, he wouldn't fear to make this weak group and, and save it. But Zhu Jingyu is, is just Zhu Jingyu in the end. He plays this uh, territory-taking move, allowing Huang Longshe to capture that one stone and easily save his group. Huang Longshe first plays this attachment, threatening to run out, and Black uh, sort of bites on it by playing here, and then Huang Longshe answers. Black's plan was that White would answer, and then, you know, <laughs> Zhu Jingyu would finally play this fantastic move, even though Black um, leaves this push behind. This ko is really awkward for White to fight, since Black could win by capturing the White corner. And, of course, the cutting point that's left in the center is the, is the main problem. So uh, White simply falls back after this, and this exchange in the center, where White attached and, and Black bumped in, uh, it actually ends up allowing white to have a much increased position on the bottom side. You know, this black stone is nowhere near as effective for attacking stones on the bottom side as this white stone is effective for saving groups on the bottom side in, in the future. So really successful defense again for Huang Longxie. Um Yeah, black should have ignored that and immediately saved his stone, in my opinion. But black is just going to continue. He plays this uh, double hane. It's a good move, even though white can capture in the corner. Black fixing his own cutting point there as a forcing move is, is good, and afterwards he has potential forcing moves on, on either side. So he can either play a forcing move from this side using the Shorge Liberty of the white five stones, or he can just play an Atari. He chooses to directly use the Shorge Liberty on the five stones, but when white captures, I think it's pretty clear to see that this is uh, too early of a commitment. For black, he, he definitely could have used it from the other side instead in many situations. The reason why he did it this way is he wanted to prevent the white clamp to just link up and, and break the territory. But that wasn't really the relevant thing on the board at the exact moment. It's more about the left side, which black goes to now. So by committing here early, what he's done is he's decreased his power on the left side, actually. He's prevented himself by playing any Atari um, on, on that one stone. And White is free to try to attack this as hard as possible. Well, what is hard? To, uh, like, what is a strong attack when you have those two stones already and they're kind of in danger themselves? It's not like White can freely play some pincer here and then get, get himself in trouble in the corner. White just plays a Hane underneath, and he waits for Black to play the overplay. This double Hane from Black, I think it realized if he just extends here, then now a pincer like this may be reasonable, and then this whole Black seems to be in a bit of... So he played this double Hane, trying to give himself a, a way to trade out. So by doing this, he makes this Atari, and eventually he can make this sort of co-shape. He's transitioned from these three stones to defending a group more directly on the left side. However, you can't deny that this shape looks efficient for white. This uh, white captured a stone. <laughs> it's so good. And white even gets the first move elsewhere, cutting on the bottom side. Uh, rather than playing this double Hane and directly going for that trade, it would probably have been better to directly aim at the left side immediately and just to wait for your opportunity to be able to play those kinds of moves, whether it be Hane or this now, which directly saved the group efficiently using all of your stones in a shape which is not quite as embarrassing <laughs> for black. Instead we have this shape, so Huang Zhe is caught up a bit more again, and he plays this cut. It's a very dynamic move, this cut. It starts a, a whole group on the bottom side, and of course black had planned for this cut, he knew this was coming when he played the Hane, and he knew he can push through on the bottom side, make a split shape of his own, and even totally finish off that one, uh, one white stone on the bottom. All the white gets are these three stones in the center. So how to use them? Well, Wang Xia starts with the turn here. It's looking to make this Atari. It's looking to threaten these black stones on the bottom side. Black does not answer. He plays over here. Black should have answered, <laughs> in fact. Black's not answer. It's trying to say, hey, I'm setting up a large-scale attack. You can't run back to your buddies. 
right? Like if this one would happen, maybe white would jump here, look to run back to the buddies. And when black answers somehow, you can see the white has gained a little bit in terms of shape towards the center. Maybe his running speed can be much faster like this. But when black immediately goes to handle that area, he doesn't realize that what he's doing is investing his stone to a spot which white hasn't tried to run yet. And white can play this Atari quite efficiently and play this Hane, basically trying to, to trick black here. And black falls for, for it. Black plays this double Hane, really trying to cut off this white. It, it wasn't good. Black, locally, if he needed to play anything, it should have been here. But even he could have just tried to play elsewhere entirely. White's connection through in the center here, it would still not be successful on the next move. But Black wanted to dominate this fight. He played this double Hane. And in doing so, he allowed White to show this area is really trash, and it's more the left side, which is treasure. Which replaces Atari, and this Atari, and this move is forcing, and this move is kind of forcing, so Black doesn't answer. If Black had answered that properly, like this, Huang Lusha would simply continue to run. And you can see this white group's shape is so beautiful. It's going to be almost impossible for black to continue an attack here or an attack on that one stone. Even you can see that the whole black bottom left is becoming dangerous naturally. That's why black didn't answer. He tried to rush. He tried to rush to the center to control that area. So he wants to be the one who can cut in the center and attack these two white groups. In investing so much in the right side of the center, he's already lost a bit. Huang Xia gained a bit again. The game is getting closer. And Huang Xia playing this Atari and this Connect is eyeing all of the liberty problems that Black has. Black has to answer those as thickly as he can, and even still he's going to have some problems where like an Atari and maybe set up a short liberty in the center later. For now, he plays the best move of shoulder hit. This is a really nice move trying to get ahead of black into the center and preventing black from any of those aggressive plans, which he wanted to do. And Zhuzhing still has to do an aggressive plan somehow, but he has to endure that this one stone is sort of going to get pressed on first. So he isn't very happy about that. He exchanges this push one time. It's not really a good exchange. And then he plays this attachment. Uh, so finally, you can see this is Zhuzhing Yu's plan. He needed to be able to counterfight with these bottom left black stones against the two white groups, he needs to cut them. This is the only way that this can make sense for black. White chooses to play Hane one time, so to make his group on the left side much, much more resilient. And we're going to see how this works really effectively in the game when black <laughs> extends and white plays the wedge. This wedge is directly showing the shortage of liberty on these five stones. And I have to say, when I was watching the game, I thought it was too early. I thought, aren't you supposed to play here? Let black cut however he wants to do that on the left side and then play the wedge. So now you have a real proper shortage of liberty technique to, to look at. Well, the problem is that if white would have played this sequence here, black would just answer right away. And he'd allow white to capture these two stones and be satisfied with his position on the, on the left. This is enough territory for black to win. And so by directly making the confrontation while White doesn't really have the power to, <laughs> to fully uh, maximize it and make it something that Black should be afraid of, Huang Xia is sort of holding two sticks over <laughs> Zhu Xingyu's head. He's baiting Black. Hey, which way do you want to go? Which one do you want to swipe at? And I'm going to take advantage on the other side. So either Huang Xia wants to strike in the center or on the left. Zhu Xingyu answers once like this, and then Huang Xia cuts directly. And Zhu Xingyu picks the left. He, he cuts on the left here, trying to take the territory, trying to defend his own group, make sure that this white group is not strong. And it's definitely a vital point. It's very important. But it didn't answer to what Huang Xiu is doing in the center. Huang Xiu can Atari here. And Black has a, a really awkward time. He chooses to Atari in the center. White answers, and Black runs, and White captures these three stones. White managed to save his weak group on the bottom side by capturing Black's Three stones. It's a fantastic, fantastic success. Even at the end, White still has a squeeze on these black six stones to get some territory on the top side. All that he's given up is the black left side territory. 
In fact, Huang She has caught up almost entirely at this point. He's caught up so much. The problem for Zhu Xingyu, here, uh, yeah, the cut was not the correct decision. The cut, it should have been answering in the center, directly playing in the center like this. It keeps a lot more pressure on weight, not only because <laughs> the uh, the center fighting is more difficult for weight to show any good shape, but because the entire weight uh, bottom side group can become in danger in a lot of variations. So it would be overplay for weight to continue from here to save the left group and then also save uh, this group when black even has some preparation everywhere. It would have been better to fight like that. Once he's committed to the left side, then Huang shows Atari here, probably Zhu Jingyu should answer. They didn't want to answer because this, <laughs> the end result looks horrible. <laughs> White can play this whole squeeze, all these Ataris play this move. Black simply has to capture like this. He can try to Atari here once first if he wants, and then White will just eat that stone. This shape for White looks magnificent. White managed to save his stones in the bottom. He still has a squeeze, a, a potential additional forcing move whenever he wants there. And he's taken so much territory on the top side as he's saved. It's uh, somewhat magical. But this way, black manages to get the left side with less punishment than the game, where white still got territory, but also got territory under these three stones, saving those. This was a significantly worse result, and the game is close. But I don't think that Huang Lungshe knew that the game was close just yet. I think that Huang Lungshe is still fighting very, very hard. I mean, Black is still leading, so maybe he's justified, but Huang Xia immediately played this Atari, which is, it's kind of like overplay. Uh, this one is saying, hey, I'm going to fight the Ko's, like, completely and try to fight you all the way back on the left side here. I don't need to just passively try to defend this Ko. So he plays this move, which is a Ko threat towards the center. Black needs to eat these two stones. And when Black extends here, Huang Xia expands the Ko again. He's, he's, uh, really making this a very, very important Ko. Problem is that he doesn't have any Ko threats which are big enough. All he has for Ko threats is a potential fight on the left side. I mean, uh, the Ko threats that he had earlier on the right side are completely used up, and, and basically this is just the, the biggest thing that he can do on the board right now. But when he tries to fight here, Black can win the Ko, and in doing so, save his left side group with threat of capturing the whole upper left corner as well in a really, really nice way. Wait, still gets this Atari, and then he can play this Tiger's Mouth underneath, and, and Wei is gonna be able to save a group on the side here, but he couldn't do anything aggressive. It would've been comfortable for uh, for White if he could've played from the outside like this and really fought this fight, but this Atari coming, giving Black the time to then answer here, it's impossible for White to make any serious strike now he can only take some position on the left side and allow black to cap inside stones. This is not acceptable for Huang Lungshe. He instead tries to fight on the left side by taking these extra two stones. Black makes sure he's as solid in the center as possible, not capturing, but choosing to connect instead. It was a fine decision. And White played this Hane. So the only way that this sequence can make sense for Huang Lungshe now is that he really gets a lot of counter pressure against these black six stones, which he's been quietly targeting the whole game as he defends himself. But when black plays this cut with the empty triangle, since black filled the liberty of this one stone, white doesn't have very many good counter pressure methods. And really, he only can bow down and, and try to connect on the second line and basically defend his group by, by life and death and allow black to connect up easily. This is not really that fun for Huang Lungshe, but he couldn't do anything else. Like if he would Atari down and play here, this would capture these six stones, but it would give up the entire left side. And black could continue uh, be it capturing here, or this move is big, or there are some other remaining big moves on the board. <laughs> Just from this, you can see this whole area has suddenly become a black territory. That was where white was attacking, and it's black territory now. It's not enough to simply have this box be white. And so Huang Yunshu didn't do that. He just saved on the side like this. 
allowing black to link up in the center, hoping that there's still going to be some Aji there. Now, the game is not really close anymore. Zhu Jingyu has picked his lead back up from just a handful of points to a full 10 or more, but that doesn't mean that the game is over. In fact, Huang Longshe is still going to be able to make himself a chance. But he isn't very calm. I think he knows, oh, I threw, I threw. I had such a good chance before, and he clearly lost a lot on the left side. This kind of shape is very efficient for black, and it's nothing to write home about for white. And it must be so frustrating to then see black get this move as well. It was more important, rather than saving those stones, which is quite big in the upper left, more important to play here, because when black plays this one, white can't answer. White has to play away. If white would have chosen to answer this, then naturally black is already protected the way Atari underneath, which is the big endgame move locally. So this is just a gain for free for black. You can't allow it. White has to fight back. He has to fight against this. White only has one remaining chance. Black captured here, allowing white to Atari and cut. White's only chance is to make something of the fighting on the left side. He needs to be able to chase this black or the black in the center or something. Something, somehow, he needs to make this work. Black captures the two stones. White Ataris. Black answers. White links up on the side. It was necessary. If uh, at this point, White would have tried to, let's say, go after these stones or something like that. When black blocks here, this group is locally dead. Uh, it's possible to try something. So if you play here and black tries to go inside like this, you can play this move as two threats. Black uh, is going to be satisfied to allow such a variation like this. He can play in from here and he can allow you to link up like this because he has this move as an Atari and he captured these two stones in Sente. So that would be really big. Huang must answer. Then black pushes, white answers, and black pushes here. White has to save his stones in the center first. He jumps like this, and black saves his five stones in the center. Black is looking at using a wedge, so Huang she answers. But this, this was the final losing move. This made it so that uh, after Black just answers and makes sure that he has two eyes with his group on the side, nothing more can really happen in this game, actually. Wong well, should make some stuff happen anyway, but objectively, the game should be over here. Black is leading by more than 10 points, and there's no weak groups to speak of left on the board. Instead, actually, Huang Lungshe made a very basic miss in, in, in this stage. I say basic, it's not that basic, but you can pause the video and try to find it for yourself. What Huang Lungshe should really have been able to find in this position that would have potentially sparked the victory. Huang Lungshe could have played Atari. The point of the Atari, if Black answers here, is that you've created a potential to reduce the eye for Black in the center. So white can now play here, or even here, protecting his wedge in a way which threatens to capture these three stones, or at least Atari these three stones. So now if black plays here, white could play Atari, and black would be dead. So black, rather than capturing, should connect and try to use the counter pressure against those white stones. Now, it seems like white needs to answer to the wedge and won't have the time to stop black from getting two eyes, but that's only what it seems like. What if you actually just try and play? <laughs> what if you just do it? Then when black plays here, and you answer and tries to wedge in like this, you can see actually black is the one who's going to get shorted on liberties. And if he answers this, then white can Atari and capture the entire black dragon. So white would be able to capture a tail of blacks. If it, the situation goes with throw in and then like this, Maybe Black's better method is to try to wedge directly. It seems to make a lot of sense, at least. Then White can play the Atari here. If Black answers, then you can see, once again, Black has become shorted of liberties. He's going to die. Black is just simply losing the capture race. 
So this throw in and then this move after wedge, the correct sequence for black should be to now trade like this. So this Atari allows white to not capture, allowing black to get two eyes, but connect here. Then black can play this in the best liberty condition possible, and it becomes some kind of a crazy co. Uh, objectively, according to my AI, this co is playable for black. So black can still win the game, but it's by a much smaller margin than before. And in practice, I think this is a much, much more difficult game for Zhu Xingyu to win than as Huang Yongshu played here. I honestly can't believe it. This kind of thing is bread and butter for, for Huang Yongshu. To see this throw in is, I mean, this is the kind of thing which Huang Yongshu pioneered is how often you should be throwing in here in situations like this and showing that your opponent has shortages of liberties that prevent them from doing the things which they want to do. The fact that these black stones have all their liberties filled on the left and the bottom side is what allows this kind of sequence to work. And it's something that if Huang Yongshu was in his most, you know, <laughs> ready and primed state, I have no doubt that he would never miss. But this is a game where he's already beating himself up for several mistakes that happened that he's already thrown on the left side and on the top side. And so I think it becomes pretty clear why Huang Yongshu has lost his mentality and can only connect back meekly with the tiger's mouth, allowing back to save very easily on the side there. And we go to an endgame. This, yeah, it's not a very satisfying endgame for White, but he's still making something of it, pressing in here, using the Shorge of Liberty. He makes this Atari preventing Black from playing the uh, forcing push, which is a very big move. Even captures here, rather than answering to Black on the right side, noticing that because he captured the three stones in the center earlier, he's much stronger than he was before. And uh, he's going to gain something in that area when Black plays this move. Black's better move locally was to play this one. And uh, Wei would actually have a hard time saving his three stones. He can't just save directly because the group in the corner is now unfortunately dead. So if Black would have wedged here, then honestly, Wei would have nothing to do but sacrifice these three stones. Instead, Zhu Xingyu just ataried this one stone and allowed Wei to completely link up. So that lost quite a bit for uh, Zhu Xingyu for no particular reason. Uh, back in these days, they did not have time controls. They were playing untimed. So there's no excuse for just like forgetting to capture three stones. They, they had minutes to think about this, not 30 seconds. But whatever. Um, the game continues from here without very much more fanfare. Although Huang Yongshu caught up quite a lot. Uh, in the end game, maybe six points of the 12, that's not enough to win the game. And so finally, um, the game record ends here with almost everything resolved. There's just a, a couple more points left on the board. They aren't going to change anything. Black is leading by about five and a half points. And Black wins game six. But man, what a fight that Fong should put up. And what a fight that Zhu Jingyu put up. I really... I really appreciate the way that this series has developed where Huang Yongshu took a few games to really learn how it, <laughs> you know, how it's possible to beat someone at the level of Zhu Jingyu, who I think would be at least Fox Eitan uh, nowadays, with three stones. That's crazy. And Huang Yongshu has learned to do it. And in response, Zhu Jingyu is learning how to beat those methods. I, really fascinating game, game six here. I think probably the best loss of the set for Huang Yongshu. I'm looking forward to covering game seven with you, which is just as fascinating. Make sure to stay tuned, subscribe, like the video if you enjoyed. I'll see you then. Bye-bye.